Dumas and Dr. Fragala Pinkham are representatives for, for today. They are co-authors of the PDCAT. Um, obviously, I work for Pearson Clinical Assessment, um, and we are the continuing education provider for this session. Um, and all the rest of the details are on the, the screen here and are in all the advertising material. So on that note, um, allow me to introduce, um, I'll, I'll run through their brief bios quickly. Um, Dr. Helene Dumas is the Director of the Medical Rehabilitation Research Centre at Franciscan Children's Hospital in Boston. Dr. Dumas received her Bachelor of Science degree in Physical Therapy from Boston University, a Master of Science degree in Human Services Administration from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and a Doctor of Physical Therapy from Northeastern University. She has served in clinical, supervisory, and administrative roles with infants, children, adolescents, and adults with disabilities in early intervention schools, home health and hospital settings. And she has presented on clinical topics and research findings and has academic teaching experience in pediatric, neuromuscular and cardiopulmonary pulmonary physical therapy. Dr. Dumas has developed fun functional outcome measures for use with children with disabilities and has published numerous articles examining functional outcomes for children following acquired and traumatic brain injury. Dr. Dumas has conducted research in hospital and community settings using the, the original um, paediatric evaluation of disability inventory and has conducted studies using the PD to examine inpatient rehabilitation outcomes and ascertain the impact of specific interventions. Our second presenter, Dr. Fragala Pinkham, is a physical therapist and a manager of research and quality improvement at Boston Children's Hospital. At the time the PDCAT was developed, Dr. Fragala Pinkham was a clinical researcher in the Medical Rehabilitation Research Centre at Franciscan Children's Hospital. And Dr. Fragala Pinkham received her Bachelor of Science degree in physical therapy from Northeastern University, a Master of Science degree in human movement science from the University of North Carolina, and a Doctor of Physical Therapy for, from MGH Institute of Health Professions in Boston. She's worked in a variety of clinical pediatric settings, including early intervention schools, home care, and hospital inpatient and outpatient programs. And in addition, has developed community and hospital-based adaptive sports and fitness programs for children with special needs. Dr. Fragala Pinkham has published several articles on the topics of pediatric outcome measurement, effectiveness of therapeutic interventions and fitness for children with disabilities. And she presents on physical therapy intervention and outcome measurement for local and international audiences. And I'll run, run through that quite quickly, but I thought it was quite important to highlight the, um, the calibre of our presenters today who are going to, um, who are co-authors of the PDCAT. And on that note, I'm going to pass it over to um, Dr. Dumas um, to, to take it over from here. Um, so on to you. Thank you very much, Shelley. I think I can speak for both Maria and myself and say we appreciate the opportunity to talk about the PDCAT. We always enjoy our interaction with the users of the PDCAT, so we are excited to present this webinar today. So to get started, I think, oh, let's go past our, um, I wanted to talk a little bit, I'll give you some brief, some context and some very brief history as to how we got to where we are today with the PDCAT. Um, many of you may remember the original Pediatric Evaluation of Disability Inventory, um, which was published back in 1992. The PD, as we call it, um, was widely embraced, is still widely embraced um, by therapists in all clinical settings and worldwide. Um, I can't overstate the impact on our profession, um, on, on the, for rehab, rehab clinicians um, in the care of children with disabilities, as it really was the first comprehensive functional assessment for children. So ma many of us have used it for many years um, and really appreciated the impact that it has made. So, but despite its popularity, um, shortcomings became um, apparent um, with its use. Um, we know that it's a paper and pencil format evaluation. It's an interview format and not a parent or clinician self-report um, as originally intended. Um, it is therefore time consuming to complete. Normative scores are only available from six months to seven and a half years. And items were on the easy end of the com continuum. So after about 10 years um, after the publication of the original PD, Dr. Haley and Dr. Koster, um, uh, the primary authors of the original PD, embarked upon the development of the PD-CAT. So the intention of developing the PD-CAT was to provide 
items that are applicable to a wider age range, and the PDCAT is, was intended to span um, the age range from infants to youth and, and young adults, um, to include items that were harder and appropriate for older children. We want the PDCAT was intended to be feasible to administer and take um, less administration time. Precise scoring was an, uh, a goal of the development of the PDCAT. Expanded scores for children or youth up to 21 years, and additional community-based items were all the goals of the, the development of, of the PDCAT. So while not um, used with the development of the original PD because it didn't exist at the time, it is worth mentioning that the PDCAT is based on the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health. Uh, the PDCAT therefore recognizes the roles of personal environmental factors, as well as the associated health conditions of the individual child. And it provides our, the, con the conceptual framework of the PDCAT, specifically at the activity and participation level. Okay, so the PDCAT, um, published in 2012, 20 years after its um, or the original PD, the PDCAT, as I said, focuses on activities and participation in life tasks as defined by the, internet, by the ICF. It can be completed by a parent independently, does not need to be done in an interview format. Provides normative scores um, for children from birth up through 21 years of age. And the PDCAT is both um, brief, for so res um, reducing respondent burdened, as well as provides pre precise scoring. So how, how is that able to be accomplished all with, with one measure? All of those, we have the lofty goals and, um, and the PDCAT was able to respond to all of those goals and, and provide all of that. Um, PDCAT is based on the statistical model um, of, the, of item response theory, or IRT. So it's a statistical model used to scale items on a continuum or along a continuum. That continuum helps to provide item estimations and interval level scoring along the scale. So essentially the IRT model, that statistical model, provides a framework for, the, for modeling the response data or the responses of the, um, respond, the, of the people that are answering the items. Um, it's used to evaluate respondents with, and depending on the same items being included, without depending on the same items being included in the test. It uses a prediction based on a person's ability or traits. So again, don't all of the um, respondents do not get all of the same items, and this is possible because of the prediction model used within the item response theory and the continuum um, and the inter interval level scoring. So the PDCAT is an IRT or item response theory based computer adaptive test. What does that mean? What is a computer adaptive test? So the, um, the IRT model is the statistical model used within the computer program. The CAT, as I said, um, is, a, is a computer adaptive test administered therefore only on the computer. There is no paper and pencil version available. And as we talked about with IRT, there is an item bank of calibrated items, and those items all describe one domain within the PDCAT. And we'll talk about those domains shortly. The CAT uses artificial intelligence to select relevant items from this bank of items. And each item in the bank represents a different level of difficulty. So the response options that we talked about that were, are along the continuum. And it goes from most easy to most difficult to perform. So in practicality, here's how it works. For each um, new assessment, for each domain, all respondents begin with the same question in the middle of the scoring range. The item response given to that item will then dictate if a harder or easier item will be administered next. Again, and to repeat, because of the item response theory used in the statistical model, not every item needs to be answered to get a score. Here's a, a little more visual presentation again of, of how it works. 
Um, in box number one, you'll see an initial score estimate is obtained based on the response to the first item. We give the example there, stands for a few minutes, is the first item in the mobility domain for um, any administration of the PDCAT. So based on the respondent's answer to that item, look at box number two. The algorithm within the CAT will select and present the next most optimal item or question. Box number three, a score, a score response will be generated. Behind the scenes, the algorithm within the, the computer adaptive testing is re-estimating the scoring and the confidence interval based on that new item. The program then determines whether the stopping rule, either any of the stopping rules are satisfied. So, and those stopping rules may include the maximum number of items that would be administered or the confidence interval around the score. And we'll talk about that some more later as well. Um, if the stopping rule is satisfied, then the, the questionnaire or the PDCAT is finished. If it's not, then another item will be administered. So how does this item selection occur? As I said, so if you look at the left, the starting question or the first item in the mobility domain for the PDCAT is always stands alone for a few minutes. If a response clinician or parent chooses um, the response option that the, that item standing alone for a few minutes is, is too hard or the child is unable, then a lower functioning mobility item will be selected by the program. If the respondent selects a little hard, then a more medium level of function um, will be administered. If the respondent chooses easy, then a higher level question will be um, administered. This is what we see as users while the item selection is being done sort of behind the scenes by the program itself. Let me give you some examples here. Um, so what is, what is the item bank? Um, so for, I'm gonna, as I said, there are low, low, medium, or moderate, and high-level items, and they are distributed um, across along the continuum in terms of level of difficulty for the domains of daily activities, mobility, and social cognitive. So here are some examples at the lower end of uh, the continuum for the daily activities domain. You'll see here some of the items include taking off, taking off a T-shirt, removing socks, finger feeding bite-sized pieces of food or swallowing in pureed or blended foods. Where a more moderate or medium type of item might include something like uses a computer mouse or rubs their hands together to clean. And higher level items might include chopping or slicing hard fruits and vegetables or cutting with scissors to open a, a package. So again, these item banks contain many items for the cat or the program to choose from all, have, all of which have been calibrated from a level of easy to difficult. So to recap sort of those, those concepts of IRT and, commu and computer adaptive testing, um, the R IRT statistical model um, used within the computer adaptive tests allows for with each new response to an item that the score and the confidence interval around that score are re-estimated. The software then determines whether the preset stopping rule has been satisfied, either the level of precision, meaning that the confidence interval is small, or a maximum number of items have been administered. If the stopping rule is satisfied, the domain ends and a score is provided. If the stopping rule is not satisfied, new items are administered until the stopping rule is satisfied. So the PDCAT, the properties of the IRT and computer adapting testing allow for the PDCAT to be both accurate, to be accurate and precise, to be administered with increased efficiency and to reduce respondent burden, whether that's the parent doing it um, on their own or the clinician. Um, and this is due to the decreased number of items that have to be administered. So there's a decreased respond a reduced respondent burden. Okay. 
So with all that, we sort of talked about um, what the PDCAD is. I'm going to talk a little bit more now, switch to sort of the clinical use, the, maybe the who, why, when, where, and how you might use the PDCAT in, in clinical use. Um, so who and why might you use the PDCAT? The PDCAT is intended for children in use, birth through 20 years of age with physical and or behavioral conditions. We see birth through 20 years of age because that is who the normative scores are available for. However, there are scaled scores in the PDCAT as well that are generated by the program. And scaled scores can be um, generated for users who are older than 20 years. Why use the PDCAT? It's intended to identify functional delay, examine improvement for an individual child after an intervention, or to assist with evaluating and monitoring group progress in program evaluation and are to be used in research. So some features of the PDCAT. Um, there's age, gender, and mobility device filters which prevent irrelevant items from being presented. Items are worded using everyday language and clear examples so that it's being um, completed independ independently by a parent or caregiver. The intent will be clear. Um, it can be completed by the child's caregivers or by the child's therapist or clinician, someone who knows the child um, relatively well. And there's also equations available now to link the previous PD functional skills, self-care, mobility, and social function scores to the PDCAT so that clinicians may continue to track a child's changes over time. So if you are a longtime fan and have used the, the original PD and you would like to make the switch to the PDCAT, we are able to link this, the previous scores to the current scores that are generated. The PDCAT um, is available in different languages. So for Windows PC, you can see the, the languages listed there. Um, the PDCAT online um, is translated in many languages. And the iPad version that is currently available uses, is available both in English and USA Spanish. So in administration of the PDCAT, there's no special environment, materials, or activities necessary. The items are intended for the clinician or the respondent to focus and to, and to respond thinking about the typical performance at the present time for that child. So the typical performance at the present time. The PDCAT can be used on multiple occasions for the same child. So maybe an initial interim discharge follow-up. There's no minimum time that must pass between assessments. We suggest that prior to administering the PDCAT, that users review the PDCAT manual, just to familiarize yourself with the administration procedures, the instrument content, the item intent, in case there's any questions, the response scales, and how to interpret the scores. As I mentioned earlier, there are several domains of the PDCAT, the functional domains. So this, the four domains are daily activities, mobility, social cognitive, and responsibility. Each domain is self-contained and can be used separately or with the other domains when administering the PDCAT. There are illustrations of the daily activities and mobility items, and again, used to, inc to are included to facilitate the understanding of the item intent. The daily activities, mobility, and social cognitive domains are aligned with the activity level of the ICF whereas the responsibility domain is aligned with the participation level um, of the ICF. There's an example of a, um, an item from the mobility domain. Um, as you can see, there are response scales and there's the illustration for the um, item walks with walking aid using cane, crutches, walker for several hours at a family or school outing, such as an amusement park or fair. The response scales for the daily activities, mobility, and social cognitive domain um, include responses of unable, hard, a little hard, or easy. And those are defined there. There is also an I don't know response. When an I don't know response is chosen, that basically is a skip option within the program in another Respond, another item will be administered in its place. 
But understand the, the, the continuum between unable and easy is important because as I said, that is how the um, items are distributed along the continuum. Um, the items are distributed along the continuum from easy to hard as well as in um, are answered from an easy um, to a hard distribution. The daily activities item pool um, includes four content areas. So there are items that relate to getting dressed, keeping clean, home tasks, and eating in mealtime. Here's an example of tying shoela sho shoelaces, which is part of the getting dressed content area. And you can see the illustration there as well. Mobility item pool has five content areas, basic movement and transfers, standing and walking, standing and walking with walking aids, and we included canes, crutches, and walkers, steps and inclines, and running and playing. In addition, the mobility domain has a subdomain with wheelchair items. These relate simply to manual wheelchair items and are administered when the respondent says that the child is able to propel a manual wheelchair. At present, there are no power wheelchair items. Here's a example item from the steps and incline content area gets on and off a public bus or school bus and you see the um, illustration there as well. The social cognitive domain has four content areas, interaction, communication, everyday cognition, and self-management. There are no pictures for this domain, but here are a couple of examples. From everyday cognition, it communicates ideas in a two to three page written assignment or report and in communication uses single words, gestures, or signs to show what he or she wants. This is the response scale now for the responsibility domain. As I said, the responsibility domain um, is more aligned with the participation um, area of the ICF. Um, the responsibility domain is the fourth, the final PDCAD domain, and has a different response scale. Um, in, this, in the responsibility scale, the responses range from the adult or the caregiver has full responsibility and the child does not take any responsibility for the item. In the middle is the adult, caregiver, and child share responsibility. And at the, at the opposite end is that the child takes full responsibility without any direction, supervision, or guidance from an adult or caregiver. So within the responsibility domain, there are four content areas, organization and planning, taking care of daily needs, health management, and staying safe. These items require that the ch children use several functional skills in combination to carry out light tasks. An example would be keeping track of time throughout the day. There's additional um, description for these items because they include so much more than just one discrete task. So keeping track of time throughout the day, the respondent will also see text that describes that this item is intended to include arriving on time to scheduled activities or appointments, coming back home at a planned time, or ending an activity on time to stay on schedule. So there are four domains. There are also two versions of the PDCAT. So we talk about the speedy version and the content balance version. So users may choose either to administer the speedy or the content balanced and may administer the speedy or the content balance using one or up to four domains. The speedy will give you up to 15 items per domain and it's the fastest way to get an accurate and precise score. It's been estimated that it takes approximately 10 to 15 minutes to complete all four domains using the speedy version of the PDCAT. The content balanced version will give no more than 30 items per domain, but the program is forced to choose items from all content areas within the domain. We talked about the content areas in talking about each of the domains. So for example, in daily activities, the respondents will see items from all four content areas. They'll, be, they'll see getting dressed, keeping clean, home tasks, and eating and mealtime items. This is, it's estimated that it takes approximately 20 to 30 minutes for all four of those domains. I think the most common question we get from users 
is how to choose which version of the PDCAT to use. And we can tell you that the contents balanced version of the PDCAT is recommended for use with children whose abilities are at the middle to higher end of the scales. And that's because the program is forced to choose items from all four content or all of the content areas within the domain. So for example, a younger child um, would have to, and, even, and they were being administered the daily activities domain, would get items even within the home tasks content area, which may not be appropriate simply based on their age. Even though there are age filters and the, the easiest or, or items for youngest children will be administered, it still may not be as appropriate um, as using the speedy where the program is determining um, which items to administer. It is not forced to administer items from all content areas within the, in the domain. I think that'll become clearer as we um, go on and do some demonstration later. So, but as I said, the type of PD cat to be completed um, can be chosen as either a speedy or content balance. And then you can also choose daily activities, mobility, social cognitive or responsibility. You can mix it up. You can do the same for all, um, but it is the respondent's choice. All right, given all that, I'm going to turn it over to Maria, who's going to talk a little bit about the ASD version and talk about scoring and interpretation items, uh, scoring and interpretation options for the PDCAT. Great, thank you. So, as Helene said, I'll start with um, talking a little bit about the ASD or Autism Spectrum Disorder module. So, that is um, accompanies the, the PDCAT program. And um, as she showed in the screener, um, questions when taking down demographics of the child's age, um, et cetera, there's a question that asks if the child's been diagnosed with um, an uh, autism spectrum disorder. And if that is clicked yes, then different items will be administered. So basically, um, there are the majority of items are similar, but there's some differences, so I'll go over that. So the ASD was developed by Jessica Kramer and Wendy Coster, uh, two OTs, um, that looked at some of the items and gathered focus group and, and um, information from parents of children with um, autism and looked at some of their unique strengths and differences. And, and needs. And what they did was they made some changes to the social cognitive daily activities and responsibility um, domains and added some items, approximately four to eight items per domain. In addition, they added, <clears throat> excuse me, um, directions to enhance <clears throat> the rating consistency. So when they asked parents um, for feedback on the current PDCAT, um, parents wanted more information. They felt like so they were providing more subjective answers and they wanted more concrete information to be more objective in their answers. So there were some hints and information provided to, to um, better allow the parents to give uh, better responses for their child and report their typical performance. Most of the changes really occurred in the social cognitive domain. So in, a diff in addition to adding items, they also found that the scaled scores reflected unique developmental patterns of youth with ASD, even though it remained comparable to the regular PDCAT. We'll talk about that further. So here are the directions or hints. What they did, and here's an example, they added frequently asked questions and item-specific directions or helpful hints. So for example, um, in this box, if you can read that, one of the items is uses words, gestures, or signs that non-family members generally understand to ask for something. So if a child is asking for something, how do they do that? And the helpful hints are, remember, if your child no longer demonstrates a particular skill because he or she is beyond that skill level, then choose easy as your response. When responding to these items, consider your child's performance using their primary mode of communication. So that could be a sign, um, augmentative communication devices, sign language, or PECs as well. So taking those into a, account, then answer the question. 
So in this table, it compares the PDCAT ASD and the, and the PDCAT. And as you can see in that first column, um, list the domains. In the next column are the total number of items in the daily activities domain, 76, social cognitive, 68, responsible, fi responsibility, 58 items. And really the number of items that had a significant difference compared to the PDCAT scoring. And what that means is when you look at, um, and we'll, um, we, We'll look at the item maps a little bit more, but we looked at response patterns of, um, of items along with other items and how do items compare to each other? So which items are more difficult, which items are less difficult and that kind of thing. And really in social cognitive, there were about 32 items where children with autism scored a little bit differently, meaning something, so for kids with higher functioning autism, things like um, maybe reading reading a book or completing a task for older kids, that might be easier than an item such as um, meeting someone and providing, when, when meeting a new person, um, greeting them with uh, eye contact, for example. So for that item, that item is usually easier than maybe reading or, or, or doing a high level um, reading and, and Assign, school assignment. However, for children with autism, often that the easier item was harder for them and would, and would shift to the right of that easy to um, difficult continuum of ability. Okay, so that was um, dealt with, dealt with um, in the scoring of that. And so even though um, it doesn't change the normative scores because those kids are um, would still present if they cannot do certain items that will still present as delayed or decreased ability. Um, it also took into account that change or shift in some of those patterns. All right. So scoring for both the PDCAT and the PDCAT ASD. So here you'll see you see a detailed report. For the PDCAT, both summary reports and detailed reports are provided. You can select which you want. Summary report, report provides the information that is contained, as you see that first red bar on this sheet of or assessment or report. That first red bar provides, the, and then under that are the scores. So for this uh, example, summary, re summary report, or actually it's a detailed report, I'm sorry. This report provides information on the score. So uh, daily activities and mobility was administered and it provides scale scores, normative scores, et cetera. I'll go into that a little bit later. Below that is every item that was administered and the response to those items. And that's what's different about the scale, the so summary report and the detailed report. The detailed report includes all of the scores and in addition provides every item that was administered and the response that was received for that item. Start with normative scores. So as, as you all know, normative scores are really based on the child's chronological age. They really give us an idea of how that child is performing functionally compared to same aged peers. So for the PDCAT, normative scores are provided in age percentiles and T scores. On the PC and iPad version, they are presented in one year increments. However, for the Q Global platform, one thing that's new is the intervals have changed. So a statistical procedure of score, um, score trajectories and um, looking at scores, they were able to break down into smaller increments, which makes sense for younger kids, especially for younger kids. So for there are one month intervals of scores for children birth to 11 months starting at um, at one year of age, there are two month intervals. So from the year one year of age up to 11 months of age um, or through 11 months of age, there are two month intervals. 
um, than there are three month intervals from two to age five, almost six. From ages six to 11, there are four month intervals. And then starting at 11 up to 20, there are one year intervals. And these are provided, these breakdowns and score tables are provided in the manual. But in addition, because it is a computer adaptive test, those scores are automatically provided. You don't have to go back and use the lookup tables. You can, if you wanted to look at the lookup tables to make some comparisons, but those are provided in the Q Global Platform um, program. Let's talk a little bit more about normative scores. So age percentile, and as you can see on the right, this is, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, bell-shaped curve, and underneath it, there are scores, um, comparing scores. And I know most people are familiar with the Z-score, which has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And you can see how that lines up really closely with the T-score. So the T-score has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. For the percentile, see, at the that's the last one that's listed. Um, it's a little bit different. And how that works is it indicates the percent of total um, number of children that um, scored below, um, below that score. So for example, if a child was scored at the 90th percentile, that would mean that 90% 90 90 of the children that on that test scored below that child. Okay. The thing I point out is that as you can see, the Z-score or a T-score that we're using here are interval level, um, very even throughout the scores. So that one, you know, you can get a standard deviation cutoff that is just a mean of, of 10 for this T-score. However, with the percentiles, they're not evenly or interval level and evenly distributed across the um, continuum. So let's talk a little bit further about, oh, okay. Um, the next thing is scaled scores. I want to look at comparing them a little bit later. So for scaled scores, the scaled score for the PDCAT is on a 20 to 80 metric. That might sound a little bit odd because usually, or you know, the old PD was on a zero to 100. So the reason behind that was because when we developed the PDCAT, we tested a lot of items, but we felt like at some point we'd want to add more items and test even more. Um, we weren't able to test, you know, thousands, and you could really look at, at many more items to add to a computer adaptive test, because as Helene um, talked about it previously with IRT and whatnot, you can have a lot of items, but you don't have to administer them all. So what we thought was that we would make a cutoff and do a 20 to 80 scale so that if we were to add easier items, then you wouldn't get a negative score because that we wouldn't want to present um, to family. So it will still stay on that zero eventually to the zero to 100 continuum. But basically, scaled scores are just a great way to look at um, a child's current functional skills and how they progress over time. Um, and it's really just the best way to look at progress over time versus using a normative score. And so that's illustrated in this next slide. And we definitely see this um, with kids is that um, sometimes they are making progress um, and we think we see them clinically, they're making progress. But if we were to use the normative score, we would see that they don't make progress. And so this example of Sam um, shows uh, at test one and test two. So for his PDCAT mobility normative scores, he was in the less than 10 percent that less than less than 10 for his T score and the less than fifth percentile indicating that he was has a significant decrease in function compared to his same age peers and then he scored a 56 on that scaled score for test 2 his T score and age percentiles did not change however his scaled score did improve and can we say how much of an improvement? We don't have enough information on this slide to tell, but let's say we had a standard error um, and the standard error was 0.5. If we were to take 0.5 and we wanted, um, we, would, we would round that up to a one um, because we wanna say how, if we were to do the 95th confidence interval, 
So we'd take that standard error and multiply it, round it up by two. So we said 0.5 is his standard error that we received in this when we, we administered it and the, the program provides that information. So we would be we would add that plus or minus one to either side. So we would be 95% confident that his score is between 55 and 57. So because the 64 is outside that range, we would say that he made improvements. Okay. This is just another illustration of, of what I was talking about. And here you can see that the normative score for this child is actually going down. But in this case, the scaled score is going up. And that's why we want to use that scale score for showing progress and the norm score for showing maybe eligibility that the child still has decreased function compared to peers. We know that um, if you looked at scale scores um, on the right, they are they're have an, you know, quite an acceleration there. However, typically developing peers are not only developing, um, are, are also developing as well. And so their acceleration rate is often much higher and steeper. And so that child is not able to keep up with that high acceleration rate of acquiring skills and therefore is presented on the left with normative scores that are going down. Okay. So on to item maps. Um, in terms of item maps, um, Helene talked a little bit about that, well, talked a lot about the um, item response theory and how items are equated to other items. And this is a representation of that concept. Um, scores are generated and you get a score form and in addition, you get an item map. Um, so this is an example of a daily activities item map. On the left, you'll see all of the items and they are arranged according to content areas um, and listed below. When, as I said, this, this map is not scored. So this is what you would see in a scored map is the numbers, which are listed here, one as unable or, uh, or unable and four as easy. Okay, so these are one, two, three, fours listed. If an item is administered, that box or score, if they score a three, that three will be highlighted in a box in red. Um, and then you'll have this, as you see, the red line will be this, represent the scale score. And then you'll have a gray bar on each side of that indicating the standard error. Um, and I think these are very important to look at um, because although you only have 15 items administered, you can look at where those line up and how the child is doing. You can look at what items were administered and what where that child should be functioning in other items. And, and it can be a talking point to actually look at that and um, review with parents and see how they are doing functionally. It's also good to look at this and look at the fit level. How well does the scores that, the, that they provided fit to what is considered that um, pattern of, of how they should be responding? So a fit score of negative 1.65 or lower would indicate poor fit. And that you would definitely want to look at to see why is that? Is it because maybe one item um, really sticks out and they and when you review it with the parent, they say, oh, well, really, I meant, you know, another score. Or maybe it's that, wow, you know, my, I've been, you know, I don't know, remove socks is way over to the left. And they say unable. Well, they, but yet the child can do some other high functioning things. Why can't they do it? Or maybe they can do it, but typically at home, they're not doing it. And so maybe that, you know, so that's a talking point to look through that as well. This is the ASD um, scoring form. So you can see it looks exactly the same. The only thing you'll see different is that the daily activities on the left where under scales, it'll say daily activities slash ASD, social cognitive slash ASD. So you know that the ASD version was administered with maybe some different items. So this, that will have some adjustments in the scaled score. However, as you can see, the same normative cutoffs are used for that. Okay. Um, the social cognitive 
so scale is the one that's adjusted. Um, so as I showed way back in those slides, the others did not need adjustments because they only had four items that were slightly off um, and it didn't impact scoring. However, with the 32 items that did need some scoring, there was some scoring adjustments, although scores remain comparable. Okay, and now I'm going to um, let Shelly take over from here with some demonstration. Awesome. Thank you, Maria. Um, okay, so I've just got a couple of slides here just that um, we've included because we've had a few questions around um, PD Count on Q Global and how it looks and how it works. So I'll just, um, I'll probably just skip a couple of these because you have these in your handouts, um, but it's more to highlight some of the questions we've had. And then I'd like to take time to answer, um, ask some questions of Helena Maria, um, which have been coming up as, as they've been presenting. So I've held some of them back for, for us to ask live at the end. So if you do have any questions, it'd be a good time to pop them into the chat box. Um, and I will just highlight a few things on here that have come up whilst um, Helena Maria have been um, presenting. So, so for some of you, you may be um, have used PDCAT on the previous version, on the, the Windows version or um, on the iPad version. So this is just um, a, a couple of slides to give you a, a look and feel of some of the, the um, useful pieces that you need to be familiar with on the Q Global version. So on the screen here is, is a typical screen of, of Q Global. Um, I've highlighted the help section, um, which is here, which is always a, a really useful section to um, get you up and running with PDCAT on Q Global, um, and it will give you lots of different resources. Likewise, we have um, Excuse me, I'm going to make sure I've got, yes, got the right slide. Likewise, we have a resource library, and this is where you access the PDCAT manual. So a few people have been asking, you know, how do I access the manual? Um, is it included when you use PDCAT? And it is. It's, it's available here within the resource library, um, which is there when you set up a, a, a Q Global uh, account. In terms of managing assessments, I'm going to skip this because I think this is probably, um, it, it's pretty self-explanatory how you um, run through an assign and an assessment within within Q Global. And if you are using it, then you can always refer back to this um, these these slides here. So, um, but in terms of administering an assessment and scheduling an assessment, um, we've had some questions around um, can you administer the assessment remotely? Yes, you can. You don't have to do it as a face-to-face -face administration, so you can administer it remotely. And this, um, this screen here um, illustrates whether you choose um, a remote administration where you actually send the link out to a caregiver by, via email or you do it in person. If you do it in person on your device, it, it if it's on a computer, a desktop or um, a laptop um, computer, it will lock your device so the caregiver can't access um, other materials on your screen, can't access your emails and things like that. So it locks it to just that test administration session. Um, so that just gives you an idea of, of the administration options. And in terms of scheduling an assessment, there is a time limit of 30 days. If you go, if you're going to email out an assessment to a caregiver, they have 30 days in which to respond. You can set it up so uh, reminder emails sent to them to complete the assessment after seven days if they haven't completed it. Um, if a connection drops, and I think we've been asked this question as well, um, if a connection drops, then you can re-enter the administration and it continues where you left off. It constantly is constantly saving your responses as you administer the assessment. Um, in terms of system requirements, it's um, accessible on any um, web-enabled device. So um, again, all those details are available on our website if you need them. Um, and I think I've covered the test screen lock. As Helene pointed out earlier, this slide here illustrates how you can choose whether you're selecting the speedy or the content balanced options, and you can do any configuration of these, and you can choose not to administer a particular um, domain if you choose to as well. And um, you can also select the language, and I think there's a couple of questions uh, come up about language um, selection. So 
at any point when you're choosing, you're setting up the um, administration, you can choose any of the language options regardless of where you are. So whether it's Brazilian Portuguese, whether it's Dutch, um, there is a question, I can just see it on the screen now, when will the Norwegian version be released? That should be within the next few weeks. It got delayed because of some platform updates we were making, but the Norwegian version will be available um, very soon. It, it, I think it's, I can't remember if it's, I think it's about three weeks or two weeks from now um, it's scheduled. Um, don't hold me exact to the date, but it's it's that's a ballpark. Um, and on the screen here, this is where you select your, um, um, whether you're doing the ASD version, whether you have mobility devices such as wheelchair users or walking devices, etc. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of those things. Um, and if I skip to one of these, so as I said, the, Assess the languages that will be released in, in about two to three weeks are the German, Swedish, Danish and Norwegian. And if I just move quickly to one of these assessments, because I think this just highlights something that um, Maria was just talking about, and I thought it's quite a useful slide. I'm going to skip through to it here. So this was... Maria was explaining the item maps and how the item maps look with the, the grey shading and the, the blocks that are uh, the item responses. So this was just a closer up version, just um, explaining what Maria was talking about with the, with the item maps and how they, are, how they are shown on screen when you get the report. Um, I think everything else in here, I think, is more useful for you to be able to see in the, in the handout. So we've got five minutes for questions and I want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So I'm going to ask um, Helene and Maria to unmute if you could and maybe between you, um, you can decide who, um, who, who answers some of these questions. But I think there's, th these are sort of ones that have come up throughout. So the first one I'm going to ask you um, is, if the item standing alone, this is one of the mobility items, if the item standing alone is your first item in the mobility domain, then how is this used with infants who aren't yet standing? So that's a very fair question. Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> no, I, I, so um, for that question, because it is the first one, you'll definitely get that administered. And be, there in the response scale, um, it does say unable. And so that is the one you would select because it specifically says child is unable to do or is too young. Um, to be able to do this. And then you would, and, and that's a great example of also one that you would not use a content balance for because especially with mobility, it's very hierarchical. Um, there are some basic um, activities and, and, co and content areas and sitting and things like that, but there's also a running and playing content area and you definitely don't want to get a couple of those items administered. So it would definitely be a good one for younger kids to have um, a speedy and then be directed towards an easier item. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, next question. Um, and this is around, again, around the mobility item. Um, how long is considered standing alone for a few minutes? Do you have a recommended time on that um, or any recommended guidance on that question? Sure. Do you want me to? Um, Go ahead. Sure. So, um, so it's a great question. So this is typical performance. So it's not, um, it's how the child typically performs. So um, it's not like a test, like the gross motor function is more uh, measure is more of a capacity test. And actually you can time kids and things like that. This is just kind of globally does, is a child able to stand for a few minutes, a few minutes, um, we think of when we cognitive tested it was more than two minutes and less than, you know, several minutes. So a three to four minute range. So I think of that when a child is in line waiting for something, is it a child that can stand um, or do they get so fatigued that you need a stroller for them? Is it a child that can stand, but their balance is off and, um, you know, some think of the uh, GMFCS level two uh, with uh, child with GMFCS level two um, cerebral palsy and they can stand, but they're constantly moving and, they, and if they have to hold, stand still, they might have to hold on. So then that would be hard for them or a little hard. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Another one. Um, do you know if the PD or PDCAT has been used in mitochondrial disease? Um, if so, as a supplementary, um, is it, as, sorry, as a supplementary question, is it more sensitive to physical or metabolic disorders? I don't know if that's one you're able to answer live or not, but I thought I'd throw it in there in case it is. 
Well, I can just say that the PDCAT is not intended for any one specific diagnostic group and it's intended to be used across all conditions. Off the top of my head, I can't think of um, any reports specific to mitochondrial disease. I don't know, if, Maria, if you, you can, but again, it is intended to be used with any, um, any condition. I'm not aware of that. Um, interestingly, yeah. um, in a, a different diagnosis, but uh, children with chronic pain disorders who are pretty ambulatory and um, able to do things um, in this one setting, um, and a group used used it with that group, um, and they found it to work really well, which I was surprised. I, uh, I initially said to them, absolutely not. So um, <laughs> it actually was respond, responded to changes um, because kids, um, you know, and, and their families perceived that things were really hard. They couldn't do it. Um, and and they and their typical pro performance was that they didn't do a lot of the mobility things. Um, and that after an intensive inpatient um, program speci specific to chronic pain, they were able to do things. So it did show it was responsive to change. So I was surprised. So, um, but again, I'm not aware of mitochondrial. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I did have more questions lined up, but we are running out of time, so I am going to have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. Um, we do get cut off exactly at the end of, of this webinar, so we will respond to you. There are quite a lot of questions in there that we will respond with individual responses, um, so please bear with while we while we get through those. Um, for those of you who may just have missed the beginning um, with the instructions for CEs, um, the slide on the screen at the moment, um, has instructions for ASHA CEUs um, and the forms that you need to download are, um, I think they're under the, the next to the chat, you can download the PDFs um, for the evaluation forms and the ASHA participation form. And um, I think we've run out of time. I don't know if it's going to carry on. Um, if not, I'll just go one more slide and there's your instructions for your AOTA CEs, but I have a feeling it may well have just cut me off at the end because I just had a, 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 a sign come up that says my session has ended. Um, but if not, um, there's my contact hear. details. Okay, we can hear. Oh, that's good. It hasn't cut me off completely then. It did say my session had ended. So um, I'll just come back to that to say that the AOTA instructions are there as well, and you'll have those in your handout. So, um, so please, um, please follow these instructions to, to obtain your CEs. And on that note, I'd like to thank Helene and Maria for um, a very interesting presentation today and thank um, Susan for helping with the chat. And um, all of you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.